tonight's presentation, Ending the War on Jugs. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's a author for numerous aviation publications. He does the first Wednesday of the month webinar for EAA. He's been doing it for almost as long as we've been doing it. Uh, Mike's a certified flight instructor. He's an AMP mechanic with inspection authorization. In 2008, he was recognized by the FAA as Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight and helping to educate us on uh, these maintenance and owner matters. I'm going to turn control of the presentation over to you. Okay, well, good evening, Tim, and good evening, everybody. Let me see if I can grab a hold of this thing. Um, well, I see that we're up over, what, 1,100 attendees and climbing, which is very encouraging. I hope lots of you, lots of them are mechanics because we're going to be, stuff we're going to be talking about tonight is going to be uh, uh, at least as relevant to mechanics as it is to aircraft owners. Um, and and uh, I think tonight's webinar may take the cake for the largest number of slides I've ever put together for a webinar. So, and I've d done almost 200 of them now in the EAA series. So, I'm going to try to go through this material as quickly as I can, so that we have uh, we have time for uh, for for some Q and A at the end, because I imagine this is going to provoke some questions. I would be very surprised if it didn't. Um, any rate, the uh, uh, the the main theme of tonight's discussion is uh, is is the fact that uh, um, my experience uh, we we tend to pull cylinders off of engines way more often than we need to and uh, so I've been sort of on a campaign to try to to do something about that through through educating uh, owners and mechanics, um, but the basic message is that just just because uh, uh, a cylinder has uh, me measures a, a weak compression on the compression test, and we'll talk about what weak compression means, uh, doesn't always mean that the cylinder needs to come off. In fact, a lot of the time uh, we can solve the problem without pulling the cylinder off. Now I've been an aircraft owner for pretty close to 60 years now. Um, bought my first airplane when I was 24 years old, so you can probably calculate that I'm a lot older than that now. And uh, for about half of that time, I've been an A and PIA, so I've been an aircraft owner longer than I've been a mechanic, but I've been both for a long time. And and for most of the time that I was an aircraft owner, and for a good part of the time that that, that since I became an A and P. Um, the, the rules about uh, cylinders were very simple, and, and the rule was uh, every year with fear and trepidation, aircraft owner puts his airplane in the shop for an annual inspection. One of the first things that the IA does after the airplane comes in, hopefully when the engine is still warm, is to do a compression check of each of the cylinders with his uh, trusty compression test gauge set. And if the number, if the reading is uh, 60 over 80 or better, the cylinder gets to stay on the engine. And if it's less than 60 over 80, the cylinder had to come off the engine. And that was, used to be pretty much what the rule was. And, and uh, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, and the, the mechanics who, uh, who mentored me uh, over the years um, seemed quite happy with this straightforward rule. Um, uh, mechanics, it turns out, tend to always be happiest when they have clear guidance to follow. Um, aircraft owners like me were a little less enthusiastic about this rule because every time a cylinder came off, it was about a, well, in today's dollars, about a $3,000 event. And uh, so we we crossed our fingers and toes and hoped that, uh, that the cylinders would all uh, measured 60 over 80 or better but uh, and if they didn't uh, off the cylinder came and and the the cash register clunked and we would have to shell out for for um an overhauled cylinder or a new cylinder or something like that um and 
my recollection is that that neither the mechanics or the aircraft owners seem particularly concerned. Uh, we we're most most concerned that it was expensive. Uh, we weren't particularly concerned about safe the safety risks involved with cylinder removal and field. Um, and and it was only um, later in my career that I discovered that the safety risks are are, are a very big deal and. Um, in 2020, I did a, an EAA webinar, which you can find in the in the uh, webinar archive or on YouTube, uh, called the Cylinder Work Risky Business, where I went into uh, a lot of details about why cylinder removal in the field was was risky and and why it caused um, a lot more accidents, catastrophic engine failures, and so on than most people cared to admit. Um, so I won't go over the details of that. That the, the it, you can you can look at that webinar if you want to understand all of the reasons for that. But I, you know I became acutely aware of the risks involved in cylinder removal in the field, um, in large because I one of the things I do is I, I get involved as an expert witness in in air crash litigation, and uh, I've been involved in a lot of air crashes uh, that were the direct result of um, of cylinder work that was done uh, that resulted in catastrophic engine failure shortly thereafter the the most recent one that that uh, that that i got involved with quite recently is uh, was this one it was a cessna 207 uh, it's a part 135 um, uh, aircraft uh, charter aircraft that uh, went into the ocean off of Marathon, Florida, in December of 2021, and uh, of course th th these lawsuits tend to happen a couple of years after the the accident. Um, and the history of this one, just very briefly, was that the uh, the the IA who maintained this airplane, who was a very very experienced mechanic and been doing it for many many decades, uh, did a cylinder change on 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 this aircraft the because cylinder uh, measured uh, weak compression and he pulled it off and replaced the cylinder um he was not a pilot so his pilot who was a a, a female um a pilot with a, a commercially rated pilot uh, he went up with her on a post maintenance test flight good good thing to do uh, everything seemed to be okay and then the second flight after the cylinder change was a revenue flight where the the same Lady pilot took up a, a couple uh, passengers in the, who were in the back, um, a, a man and a woman. The woman was pregnant. Uh, they took off, uh, headed out over the over the water, and the uh, the engine cratered. Uh, pilot uh, turned around, tried to get back to shore, couldn't make it. Did a remarkable job of ditching this aircraft. You know, a, a high wing fixed gear airplane. It's not easy to to ditch without flipping, but she managed to do a beautiful job of uh, of ditching the airplane. Uh, the occupants all got out. A, a pleasure boat in the area saw the airplane go down and and went over there and rescued them, brought them back to shore. Um, the three of them uh, were taken to the hospital. The passengers, man and the woman, uh, were uh, were were released the same day. The pilot was was hurt a little bit more, but not not very seriously, and was in the hospital for a couple of days and and was released so th this had a, a a reasonably happy ending but the uh, it was very very clear that the that the engine came apart uh, because th there was a cylinder separation it was a cylinder that that the uh, that the ia changed uh just a couple hours before before the uh, the, the accident they, they don't always uh, come out uh with happy endings like this this is a, a very famous one that i was involved with uh, a famous one because it it had a very high profile uh, lawsuit that that resulted in a very very large damage judgment. Um, but it was a um, it was a debonair that was uh, that was headed up uh, towards Northern California. The pilot was a CFI. Uh, the passenger I don't remember if the passenger was pilot rated or not, but th there were two people in the airplane, and the the, the pilot in command was a was a flight instructor, pretty, pretty experienced guy. Uh, the, the airplane had just had a top overhaul. No, I take it back. It, it had three cylinders replaced, if I recall correctly. Uh, 
Um, but at any rate, as the airplane was uh, flying up the Central Valley or up the up, up, up California, the the uh, the engine there was a big loud bang, and the the engine basically came apart. Um, the pilot declared emergency and said he was going to try to land at uh, Salinas Airport, which um, he, he he would have made it, except that uh, uh, as he's uh, headed for the airport, one of the big barn door uh, cowling doors on on the Bonanza came came flying up and created a whole bunch of drag, and so it became apparent that he wasn't going to be able to, to to make the airport. He put the airplane down in a uh, in a vineyard, but unfortunately. Um, uh, landed uh, just about at 90 degrees to the uh, to, to the rows of, of grapes, and uh, all those wires that they used to support the grapes turned out to be arresting cables, and the airplane made a pretty rapid deceleration, and uh, the, both of the occupants were were badly injured in this crash. Uh, in fact, the the right seat uh, passenger had um, a very serious traumatic. Um, head injury that resulted in permanent incapacitation. There was a very big lawsuit that 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 followed that. But um, and it's an interesting story why the cylinder came off. But it was it was uh, it was a maintenance induced failure. I'll leave it at that. I'm not go into the details. A uh, couple of more from my file. I'm not going to do a lot of these. I've got well over a dozen uh, of these accidents. The the one in the, on the left-hand side of the slide uh, was up in uh, uh, Washington State. Uh, the, this uh, airplane um, had some major engine work uh, done, and um, uh, the pilot, his post-maintenance test flight, considered it, uh, uh, putting his girlfriend, the, the girlfriend's child, and the family dog in the airplane, and flying up to uh, Friday Harbor. Uh, popular $100 hamburger place up in the Seattle area that involves overwater flight. Not not exactly your optimum uh, flight plan for a post maintenance test flight, but at any rate, as as they're flying over the water, the this big bang and the the engine. Actually, the, I think the first thing that happened was the prop went into overspeed and the pilot couldn't control the overspeed and then there was a big bang. And at any rate, he didn't make it to Friday Harbor. He put it down on a little island called Lopez Island, um, made an amazing forced landing. If you take a look at that picture, you can see that there's 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 uh, uh, telephone poles, there's uh, uh, very you know rolling terrain, and and they actually managed to get out with just cuts and bruises. The airplane was totaled, but uh, but but they got out, out okay. The one on the right side is was a lot sadder, and and I, it was one I was pretty deeply involved in. Um, uh, airplane had a top overhaul um, at, at Santa Monica Airport, um, and uh, the owner was a, a very well-known physician uh, in, in the in the area. And uh, he and his wife took off on the first flight after this top overhaul, uh, departing Santa Monica. You go to, out over the ocean. Um, the the engine uh, failed the cylinders the cylinder one of the cylinders that was uh, that, that was replaced got, it was separated from the engine pilot tried to turn back towards the shore uh, wasn't able to make it to the shore did a really excellent job of ditching the airplane um, uh, because it, 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 when he inspected the airframe it there was there was almost no damage to the airframe unfortunately the uh, the two occupants uh, hit their head on the glare shield uh, during the ditching uh, and were knocked unconscious and wound up drowning. Uh, so they both died. Uh, and uh, it looked to me like they probably would have survived if they had shoulder harnesses, but there were no shoulder harnesses installed in the aircraft. And this aircraft was manufactured prior to the time that the FAA required shoulder harnesses and they had not been retrofitted. So at any rate, I'm, I'm not going to go in, through any more of these things, but you can get a pretty good idea from some of this why I am not crazy about the idea of changing cylinders unless you absolutely have to. Um, so going back to the 68, 60 over 80 compression rule that that used to be the gospel for for most of the time that I was an aircraft owner. Um, uh, where did it come from? Is it is it in the FARs? Um, well. It actually turns out it's not in the FARs. If you look in the in the in the regulations, 14 CFR, 
the only place compression testing is mentioned is in Appendix D to Part 43, right, which is the appendix that defines the minimum scope and detail of of uh, items to be included in annual and 100 hour inspections it's kind of the, the the regulatory minimum checklist for for doing annual and 100 hour inspections and uh, if you drill down into there uh, uh paragraph d talks about what things you're supposed to inspect or required to inspect i guess um uh, in the engine and the cell group and then if you drill down a little bit further under paragraph d subparagraph three talks about internal engine inspection and the, the what they classify as internal engine ex inspection consists of two things. It, it consists of checking the cylinders for compression and also checking, it, it, it talks about checking screens and sump plugs for metal particles or foreign matter. Nowadays, most of us don't have pressure screens. We have, uh, we have full flow oil filters, so the, the way we interpret this requirement is that you have to cut open the oil filter and inspect it for metal and foreign material. Um, but anyway, this is the one place in the regs that talks about a compression test, and it says that we have to do a compression test that's regulatory. And then it says, um, if there is weak cylinder compression, this, 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 I'm quoting how, now directly from, uh, from uh, Appendix D, uh, if there's weak cylinder compression, then we have to inspect for improper internal condition and improper internal tolerances. That's that's what the what the requirement is. Um, so basically, the FARs require that we do a compression test at every annual and hundred hour inspection, um, and we have to do something if there's weak compression. But the reg doesn't dis define what weak compression is. It just uses the phrase weak compression. And it also doesn't say anything about cylinder removal, but it does say that we, if there is weak compression, we have to uh, go, go further in inspecting for uh, improper internal condition and tolerances. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how you can do that. At any rate, the, it turns out that the place that 60 over 80 thing comes from, it's, it's not from the regulations, but it's from Advisory Circular AC 4313-1B, uh, which is um, acceptable methods, techniques, and practices for um, for inspections and repairs, uh, or what we generally refer to as the Mechanics Bible. This, I'm not absolutely sure of this, but my guess is that this may be the largest advisory circular uh, in the Advisory Circular Library, or if it not, it, it certainly is close. But it's uh, it's an advisory circular that's the size of a you know, pretty good sized telephone directory, and um, it uh, provides a, a acceptable methods, techniques, and practices for just about everything you could possibly want to do uh, ranching on an aircraft. Um, so if if you if you dig into this advisory circular and you go to chapter eight there's a section um, uh, 814 that talks about compression testing of aircraft engine cylinders and it, it describes what the compression test is and how you do it and and then uh, if, you, if you dig down into there it, it, it says the following it says if a cylinder has less than a 60 over 80 reading on the differential test gauges on a hot engine um, and the procedures in paragraphs, and they have these two paragraph references. Um, but if you if you've done the thing is in these two paragraphs that I'll get back to in a second, um, if, if those fail to raise the compression uh, reading, presumably back to 60 over 80 or better, then the cylinder must be removed and inspected. So that's what it says. And those two paragraphs that it says to try, the first one says. Um, that that if the cylinder flunks a compression test, you should go run the engine for at least three minutes and repeat the test um, be, because they, they want want the test done on the hot cylinder. Um, I haven't seen a lot of mechanics do this uh, because you know the 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 airplanes decaled, all the spark plugs are out, they're running around with a compression tester, 
and uh, nobody wants to put the spark plugs back in, cal up the engine, take it out, run it for three minutes, and bring it back in the hangar. But that's that that's what the advisory circular says. The second paragraph talks about staking the valve, which basically means pulling the rocker cover off and getting a mallet and tapping the 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 rocker uh, to to jiggle the valve while a while the cylinder is um, is um, uh, has is be is has compressed air in it, trying to get the the valve to seat a little bit better. Uh, so those those are the two things that the advisory circular says you should try to get the compression up over 60 over 80 if it doesn't measure that way when you start with. And it, but it says if if you try all that stuff and you can't get this, you get the reading up over uh, to 60 over 80 or better, then the cylinder has to be removed and inspected. So does this mean that we're required to remove a cylinder anytime it measures less than 60 over 80 and we can't get it up above 60 over 80? Well, actually it doesn't. Um, and it doesn't for a couple of reasons. First of all, advisory circulars are, are not regulatory. Um, advisory circulars are advisory. And uh, the general rule, this is not just about AC 4313-1B, but for all advisory circulars, advisory circulars provide one way, but not the only way to co comply with the FARs. So, um, so th the fact that the advisory circular says that the cylinder must re be removed doesn't mean it must be removed it, 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 because the advisory circular doesn't isn't the the last word on the subject. Um, and you know, for it, so because of that, so some years ago I, I I wrote a letter to the FAA Office of Chief Counsel, which is. One of the things I usually I usually do this at least once a year, uh, and and ask the FA lawyers to interpret a regulation for me. And I I wrote a letter and and said, um, uh, part uh, 43 appendix D says that if there's weak compression, we have to do an internal inspection of the cylinder to uh, for proper condition and tolerances. I said. Can we do this with a as a with a bore scope inspection rather than pulling the cylinder off? Um, and the answer came back from the FAA lawyers. They said, "Yeah, that 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 would be an acceptable method for complying with the the Appendix D requirement for um, for checking internal cylinder condition. So you don't have to pull a cylinder off to comply with Appendix D. You can do it with a bore scope inspection, which." seemed like a a lot easier and much less risky way to do it. Um, the other thing that's important to understand about AC 4313-1B, which is a wonderful resource, but on the on the cover page of that advisory circular, um, very close to the top actually in paragraph one, it basically says that the guidance in in, in this advisory circular doesn't apply if the manufacturer has provided contrary guidance. So really what AC 4313-1B is all about is it says, if the manufacturer doesn't tell you how to do something, that then you can use this advisory circular to figure out how to do something. But if the manufacturer says how to do something, that always takes precedence. And it turns out that both continental and Lycoming publish guidance on the compression tests that that is at least either partially or grossly contradictory to what it says in AC 4313-1B, and the manufacturer's guidance always takes precedence. So if you have a continental or a Lycoming engine, um, you really shouldn't be paying any attention to what the advisory circular says about compression testing. Now, if you have a Pratt and Whitney or something, I don't I don't know whether they provide um, contrary guidance, but I do know about continentals and Lycomings. Lycomings uh, is 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 a little bit different than 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 uh, than, than the advisory circular. What, what it says is, uh, and this is Lycoming um, Service Instruction 1191A. It says um, if the pressure reading is below 60 psi, and dot dot dot, you know, if, if if you try various things to bring it up and they don't help, then it says removal and overhaul of the cylinders should be considered. It doesn't say you have to do it. It just says you, you should consider it. 
so it's it's a, it's quite a bit softer and it gives the ia quite a bit more wiggle room than the advisory circular and the advisory circular says that the cylinder has to come off but the lycoming service instruction says it, removal should be considered um the continental guidance is is grossly different from the advisory circular um the, the, the Continental Guidance is, is a, a serviceable in SB 03-3, which now is incorporated into the Continental um, Standard Practices Manual M0. And um, it, it does a, a bunch of things. Um, it, first of all, it sets the no-go compression threshold. It, it, it says, we're not going to give you a specific number, but what we're going to ask you to do is calibrate your gauges against a, a master orifice tool each time you do a compression test it used to be the master orifice tool was a little separate thing you hooked up to your compression tester and it, it represented the maximum um, acceptable leak so you you measured the orifice and you saw what reading the, the gauges gave you and then that was your no-go threshold for that particular test and then the next time you're going to do a compression test you Check them, checked it against the master orifice again. Um, nowadays, most of the compression testers have a master orifice built in, so you just turn you turn a valve to measure the orifice, and then you turn it the other way to measure the actual cylinder. But at any rate, m m most compression testers, the, the when you check the master orifice, the the no go threshold is somewhere in the low 40, somewhere between 40 over 80 and 45 over 80. So it's a whole lot lower than the 60 over 80 threshold. So the first thing that SBO 3-3 said was it, it, it did away with a 60 over 80 number and it, and it provided a, a much lower number as the, the no-go threshold. Um, the second thing that SBO 3-3 did is, is it said that anytime you do a compression test, you are required to do a boroscope inspection. Um, now, I really should put the word required in quotation marks because uh, the, the manufacturer doesn't really have the authority to require you to do anything. Um, but 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 it basically is if if Scott Nettle is saying, if we could require you to do this, we would require you to do this. You, you, they want you to do a compression a, a bore scope inspection every time you do a compression test. And furthermore, it says, if the cylinder flunks this 40 something over 80 compression test, but it looks okay under the bore scope, then the engine should be flown for at least 45 minutes, and then the compression test should be retested with the cylinder hot. So that is that that retest thing is sort of like what what the advisory circular says, except instead of running the engine on the ground for three minutes it says the engine should be flown for at least 45 minutes and um we've had some interesting dialogues with some directors of maintenance who said well uh, you know how, how, how can i possibly do that you know I've, I've i've measured the cylinder it's 38 over 80 um how can we fly the airplane am i supposed to get a ferry permit to fly the airplane uh, you know I, I can't sign off the annual is airworthy with a 38 over cylinder and we said yeah you can and they said well how can we sign off the annual and it says because that's what Continental's telling you to do it's telling you to fly the airplane and it's telling you you can't declare a cylinder as unairworthy based on a single bore scope reading i mean a single compression test reading if it looks okay under the bore scope, because clearly Continental believes that that, that the bore scope is a, is is a much more reliable way of assessing cylinder condition than the compression test, and that I certainly agree with that. But at any rate, um, I remember one of our Cirrus clients uh, some years ago. Uh, uh, the, 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 put the airplane into a Cirrus service center, a Part 145 repair station down in Florida. Had a cylinder measure 38 over 80, that which is significantly below the the master orifice no-go threshold. The the shop wanted to pull the cylinder. We said no, don't pull the cylinder. We want you to follow the Continental guidance. Do, go do bore scope inspection. Did a bore scope inspection. They shared the images with us. There wasn't anything wrong with the cylinder. Couldn't see anything wrong with the cylinder. 
So we we had this long talk about how they're going to let this airplane go fly for 45 minutes, at least 45 minutes. They finally reluctantly agreed to do that. The owner got in the airplane, flew it for an hour, brought it back to the shop. The shop was sitting there waiting with its spark plug socket and its compression test set and and, and the shop airline, everything all ready to go. And they retested this 38 over 80 cylinder. It tested 72 over 80 on the retest, which tells you something about why I am not a big fan of compression tests. So at any rate, <clears throat> over the last 20 years since, since SB03-3 was issued, we've learned quite a lot about the whole subject of cylinder condition assessment and remediating cylinder problems. Um, and um, uh, one of the things we've learned, and I've done, uh, I did a, last year I did a, a webinar on this, was that the compression test is a terrible test. Um, it's a terrible way to assess cylinder condition. And, um, you know, as my 38 over 80 cylinder that magically became 72 over 80 uh, um, an hour later, uh, a, a test. Uh, the compression test, first of all, is unreliable. You do repeated tests on a cylinder and you can get wildly different results. And we've done a lot of research on this. We've got all, all this data that, that shows that compression readings just vary all over the place for reasons that have absolutely nothing to do with cylinder condition. Um, and it's also a, an invalid test. In, in other words, it, it, it really, what the, comp what the compression test tells you has very little to do with how the cylinder actually performs when the engine is running. You're, you're testing the cylinder at, at a much colder temperature than, than it is when the engine is running. So all the tolerances are, are loosey-goosey when you do the compression test, whereas they're much tighter when the, when the engine is running. Um, you, you're testing the, the cylinder at, at 80, uh, 80 PSI pressure instead of 800 PSI, which is what the peak combustion pressure is when the engine is running, can be even a little higher than that, turbocharged engines. PSI pushing that exhaust valve closed, you've, you've only got 80 PSI pushing it closed. It, it's just, it, you're testing a cylinder under grossly unrealistic conditions. And so what you find with a compression test has very little to do with how the cylinder actually performs. Um, and, and I did a, a pretty detailed webinar on this uh, in August, 2023, which is in the archives called Unbelievable Compressions and why, why we should take these compression readings with a grain of salt. We shouldn't be fixating on them. Uh, the bore scope is a, is a much more reliable method of, of assessing cylinder condition. Um, and one of the big problems that we've faced is that that um, uh, almost th there are almost no A and P's out there that have had any formal training in how to do a proper bore scope inspection of a cylinder. Uh, it, 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 it just amazes me. But for example, Continental since 2003 has said that a bore scope inspection is required every time you do a compression test. But yet their guidance tells you all about how to do a compression test and tells you nothing about how to do a bore scope inspection. They're, they're just, you know, there's no, there's no guidance from Continental or Lycoming or, or Cirrus or anybody. So uh, we actually um, uh, created a 35-minute training video that that my colleague um, Dave Pasquale, who is arguably one of the great experts on cylinder bore scope mm -hmm. inspection. Uh, put together for us um, that, that that goes through in detail exactly how to do a really good bore scope inspection, exactly what images to take, where to position the the scope, and 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 then we created a companion checklist that that that, that shows the various um, views that 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 should be captured with the bore scope, and um, I, and I will uh, I'll provide you a link a link to that video later for those of you who are interested. It's a 35 minute video. It's very it's I think it's it's very interesting. Um, but we're we're trying to fill this vacuum where there's where, where where there's basically no guidance for mechanics as to how to do a a, a proper bore scope inspection. So we're trying to create some guidance for that. Um, but the the, the bore scope inspection not only tells you unerringly whether the cylinder is healthy or sick, but if it's sick, the, the bore scope can tell you exactly what's wrong with it 
and how serious it is and and whether the problem that the cylinder has can be remediated you know without cylinder removal or whether it's going to require cylinder removal and, and in our experience at least 50 percent of the time that a, that a cylinder um, has weak compression we can resolve that problem without pulling the cylinder off um you know bore scopes have become vastly better and dramatically less expensive over the last 20 years when when sbo3-3 was published in 2003 the the bore scope that that the continental um recommended was 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 something called the the, the lennox autoscope it was a very crude uh, optical scope with a fixed 90 degree viewing angle uh, and had no ability to capture images or anything. It was just you you stared through an eyepiece and you whittle it around and um, and it was a, it was a two thousand dollar scope, which which at that time was considered amazingly cheap because most of the bore scopes that had been used in the turbine world and so on were you know ten twenty thousand dollar scopes. Nowadays the the scopes are vastly more capable than that autoscope and 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 a, and a good one like this the video va 400 that i'm that, that's pictured on this slide is is under 300 dollars, which means that certainly every a and p and every uh, aircraft owner who who is involved in doing its own preventive maintenance um can easily afford to have his own bore scope and by the way, inspecting, you know, doing a bore scope inspection on a cylinder is preventive maintenance that 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 an owner can do. It doesn't require being an A and P to do a bore scope inspection. Um, so we, you know, we we encourage that that every cylinder should be bore scoped at every inspection, and and that owners who are interested in doing that, owners that do their own, you know, spark plug cleaning and that sort of thing, should seriously consider getting your own bore scope so so you know I, personally i think any any time you have a spark plug off a cylinder that, that it's almost malpractice not to stick a bore scope in the hole and look around i mean if if, if you pull the cylinder w would anybody not stick their head in the hole and look at the cam we really we really should be should be bore scoping these cylinders as often as we can um and one of the reasons that it's good to do it as often as we can is that the other thing we've learned is that remediating cylinder problems um, without removal is usually possible if the problem is is caught early enough. So if we can inspect these things more frequently and catch the problems earlier, we we can uh, very, very likely solve the problem without having to pull a cylinder off. On the other hand, if the if the if if we we leave things until the cylinder until the problem has gotten really bad, then it's usually too late, and and the cylinder will have to come off and get sent out or replaced. And when we remediate prob cylinder problems without pulling the cylinder, it's by using uh, minimally invasive uh, techniques, in which I'll and I'll. I'll talk about these tonight in some more detail, including lapping exhaust valves in place and performing a procedure that we call it the solvent ring flush. Now, if the cylinder is seriously ill, um, maybe it has a broken ring or, or a valve strike uh, or, or, a, or detonation damage or something, uh, the bore scope will, will clearly identify that as well. And in that case, of course, the cylinder has to come off. Um, but we should always try to avoid removing cylinders unless there's no alternative. If 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 the problem can be resolved without taking the cylinder off, it, it, that's always better. Um, it's it's quicker, it's cheaper, but most importantly, it's less risky. And the bore scope is what makes it possible for us to not only determine what's wrong with the cylinder, but determine how bad it is and and whether it's whether it's uh we've caught it early enough that we can resolve it without pulling a cylinder or whether it's gotten so far along that that the cylinder is going to have to come off so one of the two procedures i wanted to talk to you about briefly tonight uh, is which is ex very useful and that we've had tremendous success with is lapping valves in place uh, because uh, far and away, the most common reason 
that we wind up having cylinders flunk the compression test is be, because there's leakage past the exhaust valve um, because of a burnt valve. Um, and if, if we catch the burn valve fairly early before there's a lot of metal erosion or the valve has started to warp or crack, uh, then the leakage can uh, very likely be resolved without cylinder removal by lapping the valve in place. And looking at the valve with the bore scope, it's pretty easy to tell whether the valve's a good candidate for this or not a good candidate for this. If, if the valve is pretty far gone, like, like these two valves are, um, then we probably wouldn't waste our time trying to trying to lap the valve in place because because it's the, the just too too much metal that has eroded away and we're not going to be able to restore the the seal the, the valve's going to almost certainly have to be replaced and you can't do that without pulling a cylinder off. On the other hand, if 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 we catch it early, um, and the you know this the the left hand one of these is is quite early in the process. You can see the asymmetry developing. You can see that there's a hot spot developing up at the twelve o'clock position, but it it's not very profound yet. And the one on the right is is a little further along. It's kind of like maybe borderline. It it would be definitely worth trying to 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 lap it, but there's not a hundred percent confidence that that's that that's going to solve the problem. So if it doesn't, then then we may have to pull a cylinder but it's, it's always worth trying this first if the if the if the valve is a reasonable candidate for lapping um, now one of the things is uh, um, notice that that most mechanics when they do bore scope inspections if, if they're doing them at all are, are only looking at valves uh, looking at the head of the valve like these these pictures and one of the things we're trying to, to train them to do with our with our, our bore scope video and our bore scope inspection checklist is that there are other views that are, are really important. And one of them is 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 this view, which is where where you open the valve and you take a side view of the valve, where you can take a really good look at the sealing surface of the valve and also the mating sealing surface of of the guide. Um, and we, you pretty much couldn't take a picture like this with the old Linux autoscope back in 2003, but the, the current crop of, of uh, borescopes that have articulating tips, um, it's, it's easy to get, to get views like this. Um, and I think both of these pictures were taken with that NVIDIA VA400, although there are a lot of other inexpensive scopes that, that are capable of doing the same thing. But if you look at the left-hand picture, this, this is a valve where, where if you look at the sealing surface of the valve, you'll see that it's rough and that there is not a nice shiny contact area where, where you can see that it's been making good contact with the seat. Um, if you look at the, what we really want the valve to look like is, is in the right picture where, where the, the contact area is well-defined and it's shiny and it's a fairly constant width all the way around the circumference of the valve. Um, and turning that left valve into that right valve is exactly what we can do um, by lapping the valve in place. Um, anytime we lap the valve in place, which requires pulling the valve springs uh, off, pulling the, 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 the rocker off and then the, pulling the valve springs off, um, we always want to put a new a new rotator cap or rotor coil in there because one of the th one of the things we found is that um, the the rotators, especially on continentals, um, tend to fail uh, fairly frequently, and and the valve stops rotating, and that's one of the reasons that they burn is because they they they've stopped rotating, so that one part of the valve is constantly in the hottest position, and it's and it it tends to become the hot spot. Um, and the, the rotators are cheap. Um, I think the last time I got one uh, uh, working on my airplane, I think it was like 25 bucks or something for a superior rotator. So, it, you know, it's sort of silly to put the old one back on. So we, we always recommend anytime you're lapping a valve in place, if you're, since you're going to be pulling the valve springs off to do it, you, you, when you put it back together, you ought to put a new rotator in there. Um, just to, to give you a quick indication, uh, th this th th these are a couple of images that I got from a, a friend of mine by the name of uh, whose name is Dr. Gary Silver, uh, 
He owns the Cessna 421, and he's also an ANPIA. Um, he wound up with a with an exhaust valve on his Gitzo 520 engine that that started to look pretty funky in the left photograph. He decided he was going to try to the lapping procedure. He he, he did that, and then uh, 1.7 hours later, he pulled the spark plug off and put the borescope back in, and uh, the all signs of asymmetry uh, in in the heat signature on the valve were were gone. So that was pretty spectacular. That that's that's a very quick recovery, quicker than usual. Um, you know, lapping valves is something that that's oh that's always been standard operating procedure anytime you send a cylinder off um, uh, to be repaired or, or overhauled. Um, and the, the way it's done when the cylinder's off is, is, is typically by using a tool like this. It's a, a, basically a stick with a suction cup at the end of it. And you, you uh, put a little valve grinding compound between the, the, the valve and the seat and you stick the suction cup onto the valve and then you spin the valve with this tool um to uh to lap the valve to the to the seat with the grinding compound then you then you rinse it off um of course you can't do this if the cylinder's on because you, you you can't you know get access to the inside of the valve to spin it that way so when we lap a valve in place we have to spin it from the outside uh, so we we have to spin it using the valve stem and the, the way we normally do this is to couple a valve to a, to a, a cordless uh, electric drill. Um, uh, typically, I, I'll, I'll chuck a 3 8 inch bit in the drill and then couple that bit to the valve stem using a piece of uh, 3 8 inch in, uh, ID brake hose. And I, I tend to put little, uh, little bitty hose clamps on both ends to hold everything nice and tight. And then the only tricky part is is how do, how you get the, uh, the the grinding compound in there, but uh, but it's easy to spin the, spin the valve against the seat um, uh, using using a, a cordless drill in in this fashion. And I'll, we'll we'll talk a little bit about how you get the grinding compound in there in a minute. Um, you know, I first learned about this procedure, although lots of ANPs do it, but I uh, learned it from from my colleague, Dave Pasquale, who's also the borescope guru, who, who's been doing this for years and years and years. And, and he, uh, he actually made a YouTube video uh, about how he lapped valves in place. Um, and the, the way he normally would do it would be to drop the exhaust riser off the cylinder and then get access to the valve through the exhaust port, and he could go up in, in there and and uh, put valve grinding compound on the uh, on the sealing surface of the valve, and then spin it with a drill like we talked about, and, and then clean it off. But he would work through the exhaust port, um, and th th I think that's that's probably the most common way that mechanics have 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 been doing this. Um, so at any rate, um, and, and and he would he would uh, look at the at, at everything with a borescope through the top spark plug hole and um, inspect the the contact signature uh, on the sealing surface of the valve um, to see whether you know whether he whether the the valve is making you know good contact with the seat and whether the contact area is shiny and and consistent in 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 width as you as you rotate the valve around and if he's not satisfied with it he laps it some more and he keeps lapping it and inspecting it and lapping it and inspecting it until he's happy with the result and it usually takes him you know a number of iterations of of lapping and inspecting before he's satisfied and and uh, and, and then puts the valve springs and everything back together now a few years ago, um, I was doing the annual inspection on my airplane, which was a Cessna Turbo 310, and um, and I wound up finding a, a number six cylinder on my left engine that that measured 36 over 80. All the all the other 11 cylinders were in the 70s, but this one was 36 over 80, 35.7. I, I put uh, digital gauges on my on my compression test set. Um, and, and and it was obvious that that it was coming past the exhaust valve. There, there was air coming out the out the exhaust. 
so I stuck a, stuck a borescope in and and it you know I could see some asymmetry on the valve it didn't, didn't the heat signature looked looked abnormal but it didn't look terrible so it seemed to me that this was a reasonably decent candidate to to try lapping and um and so I decided to to try that but in, in on on my turbocharged uh, TSI 0520 engines, dropping the exhaust is is something of a, a pain. <laughs> and so I started wondering whether there was some way that I could do this without dropping the exhaust. And I talked to Dave, and he said, "Well, he'd always drop the exhaust." And so I thought about this for a while, and 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 uh, uh, and did a little experimenting, and finally I came up with a, a technique. For lapping the valve without dropping the exhaust, working strictly through the the top and bottom spark plug holes, and not having to take anything apart other than pulling the two the two spark plugs out, which I thought was was a, a pretty big improvement in terms of efficiency. And what I did was I got a, a, a bunch of these um, gun cleaning swabs. They they sell them on Amazon for, in packages of a hundred for for a few bucks and. The, the swabs have a have a, a, a long plastic handle with a with a plastic foam applicator on on one end, and then they're really designed they're really intended for for uh, I guess cleaning uh, gun barrels, uh, but this seemed like it would it would work and and what I discovered is if I took one of these swabs, and I heated it up with a heat gun and, and bent the the um, the handle portion of it uh, about an inch and a half or so down from the applicator uh where the applicator starts um i could i could work it in through the the bottom spark plug hole and um and and get the applicator uh positioned in between the valve and the seat and so if i put a whole bunch of grinding compound on the applicator i could get get the grinding compound in there and i would twirl the valve around and spread it across the entire circumference of the ceiling surface and 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 i could lap the valve in place and then if i saturated an, another swab with with solvent i could i could clean the stuff off so that i could inspect it and it took a little practice but it it worked very, very well and i wound up um, making another youtube video of, uh, showing how how i did it using this procedure without dropping the exhaust using these little this bent swab technique and i'll uh, i i'll Put the URLs in case for anybody who wants to watch these videos. I'll, I'll put the URLs up at, at the end when we get to the Q and A, so you don't have to you don't have to scribble it down right now. But anyway, so I I did this on this particular valve that 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 had, was measuring 36 over 80, and after I lapped it a, a few times and it seemed like it looked okay, I the, I, I checked the compression and the compression had gone from 36 over 80 to 72 over 80. I was very happy about that. Um, so I, I put everything back together and I went flying the airplane and then I decided uh, 15 hours later I would go pull a spark plug and stick the borescope back in see what the valve looked like. Well I, I wasn't thrilled with what I saw because the, although the compression was still good it was still up in the 70s the the valve still looked a little bit funky in terms of the heat signature it hadn't, it hadn't normalized the way I had hoped it would. So I talked to Dave and I told him about this and he said, well, he said, you probably didn't lap it aggressively enough. He says, that's a rookie mistake. People are, are, are usually a little chicken about, uh, about this, this lapping. It, it, you really need to do it fairly aggressively. So I decided I'd go back and I'd lap it a second time and, and use a little bit more elbow grease and a few more rep, you know, repetitions of the, of the process. And uh, I put it all back together. I went flew, flew the airplane for a while, and then I checked it 15 hours later, and bang, the the valve looked like absolutely pristine, perfect bullseye, perfectly symmetrical, exactly the way you want an exhaust valve to look. So I learned my lesson about you know if you're lapping the valve in place, don't don't you know don't be a wuss. Um, uh, you know, make sure you let you you, you lap it uh, en enough times to 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 get it really right. So in in I've recommended this procedure to hundreds of shops and mechanics, and a lot of them have, have been very enthusiastic 
about it and tried it and we've had really good success with it. Um, but sometimes I run into mechanics who are reluctant to do this because they're not comfortable doing anything that's that's not in the maintenance manual. And of course, you're not gonna find anything about lapping valves in place in the continental relay combing maintenance manuals. Um, and so they say, well, you know, if it's, if it's not a maintenance manual, how, how, how can I do it? You know, I thought I could only do stuff that if it's, if the, if it's in the, in the manual. So I'm going to take a little detour and discuss that, that subject. Um, you know, the thing that, that mechanics have in their head is this fundamental, the basic performance rule 4313, um, which, which talks about you know how we're supposed to do maintenance and and the paragraph a talks about the methods techniques and practices we're supposed to use i think paragraph b talks about the uh, the the test equipment that we're supposed to use and paragraph c talks about the the materials and workmanship and so on um but paragraph a the part that the mechanics always remember is says each person performing maintenance maintenance preventive maintenance you know alterations rebuilding or whatever all of the words are there shall use the methods techniques and practices prescribed in the current manufacturer's maintenance manual or instructions for continued airworthiness prepared by the manufacturer and that's the part of this rule that most mechanics have etched in their brains. And, and it basically, it's basically, we, we have to do it by the book. But the, that, that's, not, that's not the whole paragraph. The paragraph continues and it says, or other methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator. Um, and that's one of the most important parts of this performance rule, but it's the one that, that mechanics don't are not as comfortable with as the first part, because it's it's like, well, what exactly does that mean? What, what, what are other methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator? And um, it's important to understand that acceptable to the administrator does not mean approved by the administrator. Acceptable and approved are like vastly different words. Um, something For something to be approved by the administrators, the, 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 some FAA person or some FAA designee has to have signed off on it. So, you know, like an STC is approved by the administrator or a field approval is, or, a, or an airworthiness directive is, or an airworthiness limitation is approved by the administrator. But acceptable of the administrators is, is quite different. And the meaning of that phrase is uh, discussed at, at some length in uh, something called the FAA National Policy Notice uh, N8900.444, that if you're a, a total regulatory wonk, you can you can Google that and 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 you'll be able to pull pull up. But I think it's a three-page uh, policy notice that 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 goes into chapter and verse about what acceptable administrator means. Um, but but basically, a, a method, technique, or practice acceptable to the administrator means that the FAA would not find it unacceptable if and when it ever looked at it. Something would be acceptable to the administrator th that the FAA has never looked at or weighed in on or, or passed judgment on or, or whatever. And, and, and for a method, technique, or practice to be unacceptable to, to the administrator means that it, it has to be somehow contrary to some some uh, FAA regulation or FAA policy. Um, and the, kind of the burden of proof of unacceptability would be on the FAA. Um, but but for, for something to be acceptable to the administrator, uh, the FAA doesn't have to have, have looked at it which means so it's like how, how do we know if it's acceptable it's it's a, it's a it's a very unusual concept um but anyway for, so so the, the 4313 a says we either have to follow the guidance in a manufacturer's maintenance manual or or ICA or we have to do it some other way that won't get the FAA upset um <clears throat> 
And, and if you think about it, the regulation has to be that way because it's impossible for any manufacturer to anticipate every possible maintenance action that a mechanic might find it necessary or reasonable to use. It, the, 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 these manuals can't cover everything. Not even AC 4313-1B can cover everything. Uh, so there has to be some kind of level of common sense that we're, we're where manufacturers can, where mechanics can, can do stuff that 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 isn't in the book. Uh, it reminds me of a story. I'll, I'll try to make this really quick. But we had a a, a client with a Cirrus who, who who that went in for an annual inspection up up in uh, up in the Pacific Northwest someplace. I forget where. But it was a it was a Cirrus authorized service center, and it was a it was a, a, a Part 145 repair station. And the, the the aircraft owner had had squawked the 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 pitch trim on this SR22. The, 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 in, in the Cirrus, the uh, the the trim is electric trim. It's there's a little pickle switch on top of the of the um, side stick controller, and when you push it forward or back, it runs a little a little pitch servo motor that 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 uh, act that moves the trim tab. And he reported that this was this wasn't working very well, and he was having a hard time trimming, and it was all real sloppy and stuff. So we asked the shop to take a look at it, and they looked at it, and they discovered what the problem was. And the problem was that the screws that were holding the servo to its mounting bracket had come loose, and so the servo, when you when you actuated it, the servo wiggled around on the bracket, and it was a very sloppy kind of a thing. So we said, hey, good catch, tighten the screws. <laughs> and we got back the most remarkable response. It said, we can't tighten the screws. Well, why can't you tighten the screws? Because there's no procedure in the maintenance manual for tightening the screws. And we said, now, come on, you, you know, if, 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 uh, if you saw, a, a loose screw on a on a on a you know a, a an inspection plate that that hadn't been tightened wouldn't you just get out a screwdriver and tighten it you know what what why don't you just tighten these screws and maybe put a little loctite on them so they don't come loose again now there's nothing in the manual that allows us to tighten the screws <laughs> so we were sort of dumbfounded by this eventually i got some other a and p to go over to their shop and tighten the the, the darn screws because they were so uptight about doing anything that wasn't in the manual. But they're just, you can't, you know, the manual isn't going to say, it's going to tell you how to do everything you could possibly have to do. Um, at any rate, that, that, that's that's why it has the, the, you know, the other methods, techniques, and practices acceptable to the administrator clause in there so that, it, that, that you can do stuff that isn't in the manual. Um, and this, this is just seems like it's one of the most under, un, you know, misunderstood part of of this very simple and straightforward regulation. And, and I, I've discussed this at, at length with lawyers at at the rulemaking division and at FAA headquarters, and they do all sorts of stuff with this clause. You know, for ex, you know, for example, uh, if you have a 1947 Bonanza um, and you don't want to subscribe to to Beach beaches uh, or Textron Aviation's extortionate uh, po uh, uh, subscription policy for keeping the manuals updated. Are, are you are you allowed to 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 maintain it using the 1947 version of the maintenance manual instead of the 2024 version of the maintenance manual? And the answer is yes, you can. Even even though 4313A says the current version of the maintenance manual. Um, it turns out you can use the 1947 version of the manual. There's actually a letter of interpretation from from uh, from the rulemaking division about this, because the 47 version of the manual was acceptable to the administrator in 1947, and nothing has happened since then to make it unacceptable. So, I mean, this is a very important part of the regulation, but it's one that's not very well understood. But anyway, any rate, so if you go back to this this national policy notice that talks about what acceptable to the administrator and acceptable to the FAA means, it says uh, the terms acceptable to the administrator and acceptable to the FAA uh, uh, appear in, in, in numer numerous times in the FAA regulations. Uh, 
And then it talks about, you know, various places you might find acceptable things like service bulletins and advisory circulars and industry standard practices and also a big long, long laundry list. <clears throat> and, and then it says, um, if an item is required to be acceptable to the FAA, the FAA's active review and acceptance prior to its use is not normally required, which is basically what I was saying earlier. The FAA doesn't necessarily have to have ever looked at it for it to be acceptable to the administrator. And then, and then it, it, it says, at a minimum, the person using it, it being the method, technique, and practice, should be able to articulate a clear and reasonable basis for the action taken being ex acceptable practice or procedure. So it basically says if you if you want to do something that's not in the book, um, you have to be able to explain yourself if somebody asks if if somebody from the FAA asks you to to defend why you did it, and and that seems like a pretty reasonable reasonable rule. So it, it says if you do something wild and crazy, you know if look if if I if I said hey I've been I've been installing spark plugs on my airplane for sixty years. I don't need to use a torque wrench. I can just do it by the that feels about right method, uh, TFAR method, um, because I've got a calibrated wrist. Well, I don't think that would be acceptable administrator. I, I would have a really hard time justifying that. Um, but you know, on the other hand, if it, you know, the, 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 if I said, well, you know, I, if 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 the screw is loose on holding the the servo to the bracket, and and I, I tightened it because I, that's always been the rule that if a screw is loose, you tighten it. Um, I think that would be acceptable to the administrator. But of course, I'm only guessing because the administrator hasn't hasn't passed judgment on either of those two things. And and I'm not going to really go and ask the administrator, but that, that's my best guess as to the one thing would not be acceptable, the other thing would be acceptable. And really, all we need to do is is you know use reasonable judgment. So. Getting back to the where we started this little excursion, is lapping a leaky exhaust valve in place acceptable to the administrator? Could we articulate a clear and reasonable basis for lapping uh, in place being acceptable? Well, let me take a stab at, at, at articulating a clear and reasonable basis. First of all, lapping valves has, has been standard operating procedure forever. Um, when cylinders are, are being repaired or overhauled. So, you know, if, if lapping is, is acceptable to the administrator when the cylinder's off the engine, you know, on what basis would it be unacceptable when the cylinder's mm -hmm. on the engine? Okay, so also hundreds of A&Ps have been doing this for decades and with great success. Um, it's minimally invasive, so it's much less risky than removing the cylinder. And then for years, this wild and crazy dude named Mike Bush has been going around doing Oshkosh presentations and, and webinars and writing articles in AOPA Pilot Magazine and any place he can do it about how good this is, what a great idea this is. And, and so far, as far as we can tell, nobody in the FAA maintenance division or rulemaking division has, has ever questioned his acceptability. So to me, that seems like you know, a, a, a reasonably persuasive articulation of of why um, uh, I, I think it's reasonable to think that this would be acceptable to the administrator. Um, administrator had plenty of time to to say that it wasn't acceptable, and and it's been very high profile, and 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 nobody in the FAA has ever questioned it. So I think that's pretty a pretty reasonable argument. Obviously, that's my opinion. Uh, every mechanic who does this has has to decide whether he can uh, articulate a, a a clear and reasonable uh, basis for for why it's acceptable. But but you know I I think there's pretty good evidence that that it would be considered acceptable to the administrator. And maybe someday the administrator will decide to take a look at it. Actually, it doesn't have to be the administrator. It could be one of his minions. Um, but you know, un until the FAA makes some pronouncement about this, I, I think that it's much more likely than not that it's acceptable to the administrator than it is unacceptable. So, uh, 
that's my, my little speech about how we how we deal with things that aren't aren't in the manual. So that brings me to the to the second and last um, uh, procedure that I wanted to talk about about how how we remediate problems with cylinders without pulling the cylinders off. And, and it's a procedure called a solvent ring flush. Um, it, it turns out that a lot of the time, the, you know, the 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 other reason that cylinders flunk compression tests. Uh, besides having leaky exhaust valves, is because there's leakage past the rings. And what we found out is that a lot of the time when there's leakage past the rings, it's because it's not because the cylinder's worn out, but it's because the 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 um, the, the rings are are, are gunked up uh, and are are not they're sludged up, and they're not free to move in in the in the cylinder grooves. Um, uh, this this stuff that 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 gunks them up, which uh, is is has a lot to do with the fact that we're using unleaded fuel, and we have some pretty good evidence that once we've completed the transition to unleaded avgas, which is I'm sure going to take years, um, this will be a lot less of a problem than it is than it is now. Um, but at any rate, um, uh, the the the, the Problem is that we get sludge buildup in the in the in the ring grooves, uh, in the in the oil control ring, which is a slotted ring with a with an expander spring in it, and lots of places for for uh, for uh, a sludge to accumulate, and in those little um, oil feed holes in, that are in the piston that that meter oil out to the oil control ring and. Um, uh, th that are it, you can see it pretty well in this picture. That are uh, the, the holes that are bored in the piston, um, in in the uh, in the oil control ring groove that that takes oil from inside the piston and allows it to come out to the oil control ring and get smeared onto, onto the cylinder walls as the as the piston goes up and down the cylinder. Now, now once again, and much like what we we're talking about with the with the valve problem. If the condition is caught early enough, it can be remediated without cylinder removal by using this procedure called a um, um, a solvent uh, flush procedure. Um, it's something that's best done at the time that you're doing an oil change because after you do it, you're going to have to drain all the all, uh, all the oil out of the out of the engine. So it's it's good to do this when you're doing an oil change. And we we uh, I've got a we've done a three page very detailed procedure write up that that um, I'll, I'll give you the URL of if you're interested in downloading it. Um, this solvent flush procedure was originally developed uh, by Ed Collin, who is um, a um, incredibly in intelligent um, uh, lubrication chemist, used to run the Exxon um, engine lab for many years. He's, uh, among other things, he is the developer, the inventor of, uh, of CamGuard, which is a, a, a very good uh, anti-corrosion um, um, and anti-scuff additive that, that I have been using for many years in, in my aircraft engine. And uh, he 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 just he he knows he's just a specialist in in lubrication. He owns an airplane, and he's he's uh, he's just very just a wonderful resource in, in in anything having to do with with engine oil. But anyway, he he originally came up with this idea, and then I I worked with him uh, at length to to develop the uh, the procedure and make it as as bulletproof as as possible before we 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 wrote it up. I won't go through it in, in great detail with you. If you if you if you actually want to do it, you ought to download the the, the full doc, the three page document that goes into it in detail. But basically, you you make up a, a solvent mixture. It's a, it's a it's a gallon of of mineral spirits, otherwise known as varsol. A gallon of paint thinner, xylene, or in some some places like California, where I am, you can't buy xylene anymore because it's high VOC. So you can get xylene substitutes. Um, Home Depot sells something called Clean Strip Paint Thinner. It works fine. Uh, the, the the actual concoction here is not terribly critical. And then a couple of quarts of uh, of engine oil, Aeroshell W100 or whatever your 
whatever engine well you have uh, hanging around your aircraft engine well just so things won't get too squeaky uh while you're doing this this flush procedure <coughs> excuse me so anyway the the procedure basically this is a very abbreviated version of it um the, you, you basically remove the top spark plug and you position the piston at bottom dead center with both valves closed so that you're you're right at the at the beginning of the compression stroke um and then you pour about a pint of this solvent mixture into the combustion chamber and you put the top spark plug back in uh, i uh, i don't think the solvent mixture will harm the spark plugs but I personally just in an abundance of caution, I usually j use junk spark plugs for for this rather than the the real spark plugs. So and and then you then you you pull on the propeller in the direction normal direction of rotation in order to force this solvent mixture through the ring pack and and into those little oil feed holes. And then you repeat the procedure a couple times. Um, and, and again, it's, we've written this up in detail, and I'll put this URL up um, when we get to the Q&A, so you can copy it down. You don't have to copy it down right now. Now, often it takes quite a bit of effort pulling that prop the first time you do this, because the the the, the ring pack is pretty badly sludged up, and then and each time you you force the the uh, the, the solvent mixture through the ring pack, it, it, it removes a certain amount of the sludge. And so subsequent repetitions of the procedure require progressively less force. And after a couple of iterations, uh, you, you'll, you'll normally, it'll be pretty easy to pull the prop through and, you, and you'll hear the, the fluid squirting through the holes and it's, it's, a, it's a very gratifying <laughs> feeling. It's very, a very tactile sensation. And and once once you sense that the fluid is passing pretty freely through through the ring packs, you, that, that you're you're done. You've cleaned you've cleaned stuff out. Um, but sometimes you'll discover that the the ring pack is is sludged up so badly um, that no matter how hard you pull on the prop, you just can't you you just can't get the the piston uh, uh, up to, to enforce this fluid through the ring packs. It's just, it's just uh, sludge up so badly that, that you can't do it. And in that case, what started off as being a, a therapeutic procedure turns, turns into a diagnostic procedure. And you, what you have determined is that this cylinder is so badly sludged up that the only way you're going to be able to clean this up is to pull the cylinder off and, and, and pull the rings out and clean up the piston mechanically. Uh, and this is, you know, another one of these cases where if you catch it early, you can clean it up with, with, with the solvent flush. If you wait too long, then, then you'll discover that you can't. And, and then you know that, that you have no choice but to pull the cylinder. Um, and and it's very common to you know say do a, a solvent flush on a six cylinder engine and discover that you can clean up five of the cylinders just fine this way and the six cylinder just turns out to be uh, uh, you know beyond beyond salvation and and it's going to have to come off but uh, so, so the well, as I say this is a procedure that that, that is intended to to be therapy but sometimes is is diagnostic instead. And, and it's such it's a such a simple and non-invasive thing. It it takes very little time. It it doesn't really require disassembling anything other than just taking off the cowling and and, and, a, and the spark plugs. That, that that it's definitely worth trying. I mean, there's just nothing to lose by trying it. So you know, any any time uh, uh, an engine is is burning excessive amounts of oil or or it has a lot of leakage past the rings when you're doing compression tests or something. This is always worth trying, and you know, and and a lot of the times it will succeed, and once in a while it, it it won't succeed, in which case you know you have to do something more invasive. Um, here's here's one experience. It's a, a guy I, I found this on on a Mooney Space forum. It's he says a uh, one cylinder had 
had very low compression. You could hear air was leaking past the ring. So we tried doing the flush and the cylinder made 75 over 80 after that. So it, it's, it, you know, when it works, it works spectacularly well. Um, occasionally it doesn't work, but it's, it's so simple. It, it's, it's crazy not to try it. So at any rate, um, the, the, again, just the bottom line is um, uh, I, we, we really should try not to be in this mode of any time a cylinder has weak compression, we have to pull it off. Um, the, you know, maybe we have to pull it off, but we certainly should try less invasive techniques that are, are, are quicker and easier and cheaper and less risky th than cylinder removal. Um, the first thing we need to do is a good bore scope inspection to, to find out, first of all, exactly what's wrong with the cylinder, and second of all, how far gone it is, and you know, whether, whether we've caught it early enough that, that we can remediate it without cylinder removal or whether it's so far gone that, uh, uh, that, that we can't. Um, and that's the, the nice thing about the boroscope is, is, is it, you know, it tells you a lot. You can look at it and you can say, hey, that, that top valve's a great candidate for lapping in place. That bottom valve, ah, it's too far gone. We can't, we can't help it. <laughs> Actually, if you look really close at that bottom valve up in, in the slightly to the right of the 12 o'clock position, you'll see that there's a, that there's a, a hoop stress crack in that valve. So that, that valve, would, would would probably have disintegrated in another hour or two of of, of operation. That that valve is uh, is in extremis. We definitely not a candidate for for lapping in place, but a lot of valves are. Um, and uh, if it's a, if it's a decent candidate for lapping in place, uh, it's definitely worth doing. And if if you use my little bent applicator technique, you you, you can do it you know, without dropping the exhaust or doing anything particularly invasive, just working through the top and bottom spark plug holes with a bore scope of the top hole and you're, you're swabbing the bottom hole and electric drill to spin the valve. It's, 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 uh, it's, it's not a hard procedure. Uh, and if the valve is, you know, is leaking past the rings, try the solvent flush. That's an even easier procedure. Uh, that's just, you know, it's something you just do it in oil change and um, it, it, works a lot of the time uh, once in a while it doesn't but it, but it's so simple that it's crazy not to try it at least um so we we should think of cylinder removal as being the, the last resort uh to be done only after the, these less invasive and less uh, risky techniques have been tried and with that i will uh if there's some little time left i, I know this has run kind of long uh tim but we can open it up for some q a and i put on this this slide which we'll leave up for a while um the urls the the, the first one is is the bore scope training video the 35 minute video on how to do good bore scope inspection of the cylinder the the second one is the the lapping in place without dropping the exhaust video and the third one is the three page write up uh, for the solvent ring flush. So if you wanna click your little snap a, a screenshot of this particular slide, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get all three of those uh, URLs. All right, Mike, great presentation. Thank you. We got a couple minutes here before our end time. Let's, let's try and get one question. I got a good one here from Jim. What are the most common problems that you can run into when a cylinder is removed, replace or rebuild? what are the i i take it he's talking about what are the risks and yes. you know i i i have a webinar on that i spend an hour on that but uh one of the the, the, the there are there are so many ways to 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 mess up a, a cylinder replace a cylinder uh installation is is pretty much um it, it 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 requires that that you do everything exactly right and there are a lot of ways to to not do that um it's very frequently we have problems getting um the, the right preload on those fasteners um so so that the 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 fasteners wind up failing uh uh, in fatigue 
uh, fatigue fracture that, that allows the cylinder to, to separate because the, the mechanic tried to, to, to torque the fasteners correctly, um, but for one reason or another, was, the, the, he was not, not capable of getting the, the appropriate preload. Either the fastener wasn't sufficiently lubricated when he did it, the, or, the, or the threads were, were damaged, or he tried to reuse um, the, the, the old nuts instead of putting new nuts on. There are just so many ways. Um, the, the, that 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 one with the bonanza that went into the in, into the uh, um, vineyard uh, was due to uh, to a mechanic who used uh, some sealant to on, on the on the uh, cylinder base O ring when he was installing the cylinder, um, and he did that because uh, because he had just come from a from a uh, um, a, a, a Bonanza Society event where a, where a continental tech rep was there and was touting this great sealant, this uh, that that uh, a, a, a continental gasket maker that that, that 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 was supposed to be good for 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 all that ailed anything, and so um, he, he the mechanic checked with with his boss and says that okay use gasket maker on the o-ring and the boss looked it up in the book and said yeah it looks like looks like it's okay and it's the use of the gasket maker that 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 let the cylinder came off we have we've had a bunch of cylinder separations due to people using rtv or or it's you know any kind of sealing even a little paint on the on on the uh the cylinder deck or the cylinder mounting flange can can cause a cylinder to separate. Um, it, it's just a, a real zero tolerance thing. Another another problem is uh, is that that the mechanics who will will do a top overhaul and will leave the engine with all of the through bolts torque relieved uh, are that, that's just an invitation for a spun bearing that can cause the engine to throw a rod and come apart. There are just many, many different ways that that uh, uh, cylinder removal and reinstallation can result in catastrophic engine failure. And everything has to be done exactly right, and the manufacturer's guidance leaves something to be desired. And personally, I just I don't think that many mechanics are as aware as I have become through my expert witness work as it just how often cylinder removal in the field can cause a catastrophic engine failure and so that they 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 approach this whole thing with with a certain amount of uh um the, they don't have an adequate amount of fear <laughs> they, they they treat it as something that's kind of routine they get kind of complacent about it and, you know and you know mechanical replaced hundreds and hundreds of cylinders and nothing will have gone wrong and then that you know, 301st one, we'll, we'll, the thing will come apart. Um, but it's 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 very unforgiving. It has to be done exactly correctly, and um, it, it 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 just doesn't make sense to take the risk of removing a cylinder if you don't have to. Sometimes you have to, but in which case we should be very careful. But um, if, if you don't have to, it's crazy to take the risk. And, and, and what we found is that an awful lot of cylinder problems can be resolved without removing cylinders. Well, Mike, hey, thank you so much. Great presentation. Wonderful turnout tonight. Uh, over 1,300 people that mm -hmm. I saw logged in here. Um, why don't you take a moment and, uh, yeah, and share your closing a... thoughts with everybody? I'm sorry we have a hard stop because I, I, I imagine you probably have a few more questions that we didn't have time for. But anybody that's, that that has a question and that uh, you feel free, my my email address is is uh, is on this slide and and feel free to drop me an email and I'm happy to happy to answer questions uh, that way. And I'm sorry this ran long, but I I just had a lot of lot of stuff to cover. So, um, at any rate, just very very. Quickly, um, uh, if you're not on my email list for for uh, uh, we send out a, a a monthly newsletter and various other interesting things, um, uh, 
but the, the the easiest way if you're if you're in North America to get on the mailing list is to text the word savvy s a v v y to three three seven 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 and if you're if you're not in north america that you, that probably won't work and so the next easiest way is either to go to the savvyaviation.com website and and um up at the very top of the screen there's a little link you can click to put yourself on the mailing list or during the um the, the post webinar survey that Tim is going to put up and would like you to hang around for <laughs> Uh, there's a checkbox that you can check, uh, and if you check it, then you, you, you'll, you'll put yourself on our, on our mailing list. Um, my, my four books are available at, uh, at, at Amazon Aircraft Spruce, EAA Bookstore. The first three books are available in audiobook form, uh, available on Audible, and we're feverishly working on the fourth one and hope to, to, to have it uh, done probably in about about two months, I think we're about a third of the way through uh, the recording of the uh, of, of ownership volume two. Um, those the last three books are each 500 page book, so it's a big effort to to do the audiobook form. And um, the, the, I do a podcast uh, with my colleagues uh, uh, Colleen Sterling and Paul New. Um, all three of us are A and P I A S and we do a podcast that's produced by AOPA. It, it's on twice a month, and um, it's a call-in show. So if if you have a question you'd like to participate in the in the podcast, which we would love for you to do, kind of like one of these Stump the IA podcasts, um, uh, you send your question to our, our producer um, Ian Twombly at podcasts at AOPA.org, and he'll try to schedule you. Uh, uh, to get on uh, one of our uh, recording sessions, and finally, the the last the, the the next three first Wednesday of the month webinars that I'll be doing um, the 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 May webinar, um, which I'm going to. By the way, Tim, I'm going to be doing that one from from Houston. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm, I'm going to be at the at the Shell Research Center there, uh, trying to learn the deep dark secrets of what the aeroshell people are doing and. Oh, so that I'm, sounds uh, good. I'm, so I'm going to be uh, doing uh, doing that webinar from Houston, but that's going to be a, about our Borescope initiative, uh, both both the, the training video that I that I mentioned briefly tonight, and and our um, Borescope image repository where we've created a cloud based place where you can you can store you can upload, archive, uh, uh, classify, uh, generate reports and everything for Borescope images. We're we're really trying to, you know, to to fill this vacuum about the the, the fact that that there really hasn't been any any good guidance or support by manufacturers for for borescope inspection. So we're trying to uh, to put together all of the things that that are needed for mechanics to really do good borescope inspections and make really good use of those images. And and so I'll be talking about that in, in the May webinar. Uh, June, uh, we'll be talking about uh, kind of a little bit the same stuff we were talking about tonight, uh, talking about the, the benefits of using minimally invasive uh, maintenance procedures and trying to not take things apart any more than we really have to in order to solve problems. And then um, the, the July webinar is called The Tale of Two Pre-Buys, where, where I'm, I'm, I'm talking about uh, um, pre-buy inspections, pre-buy examinations uh, of aircraft and, and illustrating um, what to do and what not to do by telling two real life stories of pre-buys, one, one of which went disastrously wrong and the other one of which went disastrously right. <laughs> so um, th those are the, th that's, those are the next three webinars, Tim, and uh, that's really all I have for tonight. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, Brock just says, I've appreciated your wealth of knowledge uh, and thinking out of the box over all these years. Uh, Chester says, uh, thank you, great information. So thank you so much, Mike, sure do appreciate it. And to everybody who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. We'll see you guys uh, next month.